There we are in action. <laughs> So actually, before we get into um, Cynthia's work, we're, I'm going to ask Ellen. Uh, Ellen, how is this creating this show for 440 different than other gallery shows? Well, first of all, it was an invitational, and for that reason, instead of having to, you know, with a regular juried show, have to sift through um, perhaps hundreds of submissions before. You, we narrowed it down to 13 and then to go through those images and choose the ones that we felt would work best. We, we just had our 13 artists because they were invited by gallery artists. And then I think the challenge and fun of it was really to find a way to make artists who had come together randomly to make the make the show work so and I'm, I know that's in some ways you know that you share those feelings but maybe you have some others I don't know what was what was really fun about it and what was the biggest challenge for you Karen um I like this question because they're both the same answer in a way that yes. um it was really fun to um find the connections because you know, we have connections um, with our gallery mates, so it, it kind of makes sense that there would be connections with the people that they chose. And um, so finding the connections and then choosing the pieces that would um, complement one another is, um, is the fun part and the challenging part because you're choosing on a screen and then when you get them in the room, you want to find a way to hang them that they uh, each piece is shown to its best advantage. And um, so that was um, amazing when we found a way that everybody's piece could really sing in that space. Oh, and I, I, let me mention this. Um, so we're gonna ask questions of these four artists. If you have questions, Feel free to put the questions in the chat and we'll get to them after we've asked our questions. Or if you want to unmute and ask at the end, um, if you'd prefer that rather than putting in the chat, either way, we'll get to everybody's questions. Um, but now Ellen's gonna ask Simga uh, about her work. Can we look at uh, Simga's piece while, um... Okay, Simga, this is an extraordinary piece. It is a print uh, and it's a very large print and it doesn't necessarily read, oh, thank you for that. Um, it, for those of us who aren't tremendously sophisticated about printmaking, um, I wonder if you could tell us uh, something about your process uh, in making this and also, um, the Myth of Construct, and it's one of a series. I know it has um, special meaning for you that comes out of your culture and your life, and I wondered if you could talk about that as well. Yeah, um, so just as a start, like this is a reductive woodblock. Um, it was a um, the piece itself is large. The woodblock itself is quite large too, and a bit longer than the piece. So I can uh, register it and manage to put the paper on the same place each time. Reductive meaning um, I first put the circle and the square and the bottom and like not no carvings in it at all. So the bottom layer would be the light mint green color. And then as I am keep on layering, I would carve a little bit more inside. So you can see the layers there. Um, so each layer I would keep carving. And I think this is about um, seven or six layers. I'm not sure now, <laughs> I can count it there. But uh, yeah, that's how I usually do these large reductive wood blocks. And it is part of a series um, where I was, inspecting um, more or less um, like these superstitions, traditions and uh, religion 
and like Turkish culture where I come from. Um, and that's what mainly what I'm inspired by. Um, it's not necessarily since this is a quite like a seemingly abstract piece, I don't necessarily want to like expect that to reflect too much, but it is an important point for me to start these pieces to create a compelling image. Um, and the wood block itself helps a lot to create that with the embossment and the wood grain that comes through. Um, with this one, since it's not much of a, um, like with my other pieces, sometimes the grain comes through a bit more. This, since it's layers up quite a bit, the grain um, still comes through, like it chips away on the sides. That's why those like unevenness happen in the circle, but, and I find it charming and it's, um, for me, it's important to have it and come it together. Uh, Yes, Ivy, it's always, for me, very exciting to see the hand of the artist. I don't know if that's true for other people. And I love having this, um, you know, this, this close up so that people can get a sense of it here. Uh, but they're quite, I mean, uh, the, the, just the challenge of uh, printing something that large uh, and um, and this is this is one of a series. There are others. It was a very hard choice. It's very beautiful. <laughs> yeah, uh, very it took, beautiful. yeah, it took two months to finish this one, and there are yeah more comp um, there are more pieces that are have even more colors than this too. So um, yeah, it's it it was worth it in the end. <laughs> Yes, well, we're very honored to have had your piece in the show. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, it works beautifully and it worked beautifully on the card as well. So yeah. thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to say? I mean, yesterday we talked a little bit and you said a little oh. more about your, the, the cultural history that kind of came into this and what, the, what some of the um, references, at least for you internally, are as um, you were making this piece? Yeah, uh, yeah, there, um, as I said, uh, the culture and um, superstitions uh, are important and sometimes they're specific, sometimes they're not. And for this one, it was quite a specific thing that I was uh, looking at. Um, so it was not a superstition per se, but it was a, uh, religious um, tradition, let's say. Um, so, in I think we all are familiar with the concept of like holy water and like Christianity and all that. But in Islam, it doesn't really exist, at least not in Quran. Um, but it is still like a version of it exists in the culture. I'm not sure how widespread it is in other countries, but it exists in Turkey pretty widespread. So the way that it's done is like people would read the words of sections of Quran to water, like basically just whisper it into the water to bless it. And it is like, if you drink the water, you, it will bring you good luck. That's why like parents uh, would give the, would go to imams or like people who went to Mecca, like do the, the Hajj. Um, or just like people with, I guess, higher religious authority, um, more spiritual authority, I guess, would go to them, get the, their the water blessed and give it to their kids so that they would do good in university exams and such. Um, and I, uh, in, in our family, my grandmother's little sister uh, did that. She went to Hodge and like, I guess she had her words are powerful. Um, so my mom would get her to like do the thing, to bless the water for me. So I would <laughs> in the end drink it. But it's, I, I think why I so was so fascinated by it was like, it's the way that it happened, like the whole family would be in this like small living room and like everybody would be quiet. Like they're, 10 people in this room and nothing, no one, no one's making any sound. Um, even the kids, like no one makes any sound. And 
uh, like she would like whisper and like start to like rock back and forth and it's it 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 was basically like a shamanic ritual right and then like this um like religious thing it's yeah this like was the start of my fascination with this topic and I was thinking of how um like these big religions that claim to come from like a single source a book um don't exist by themselves purely it's good and when a culture adapts that religion it usually still brings their own thing to this that religion and like that's what very evil eye comes from too that's why I'm always like fascinated with, by that and the image of it comes through in this piece too um the eye that looks in between li lines basically but yeah that's where I began where it came to uh, and I like to tell the story like the in situations like this I don't necessarily like to write them in detail um, and I like to talk about them and I, it also brings me back to that like oral tradition of storytelling in um, Turkish history um, but yeah <laughs> Great. Yes, I always feel as, as somebody who uh, works very abstractly um, also, uh, I, you know, a piece, the artist often has a narrative for the piece, usually has a narrative. And there are a lot of deep, uh, a lot of resonance within a piece for the individual artist. And we may choose to share or not to share, um, wanting people to bring their own experience to the images that we make. Uh, but thank you for sharing that with us today. So. Yes, yeah, definitely. Thanks. And I, before I end, like, I really want to thank Gail for inviting me for this and having me in the gallery. It's such a pleasure just to see it in with everyone's work. And it was a great show. Great. Thank you. Well, I hope to see you again. I saw you when you um, dropped off your piece. Uh, came through the door with this big paper rolled up and there it was gorgeous pristine astounding uh, and um, I hope that you'll come to the closing party and that people can meet you there and can see your work in person I hope so too <laughs> thank you Karen oh yes yeah. so I think we're moving on to Francis Jetter so yeah let's take a look at Francis's work and uh, we're lucky to have some details as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of amazing that um, we ended up with sculpture, uh, photography, paintings, drawings, and prints, and everybody took a different approach and everyone has a different um, inspiration for their work. And um, I wonder if you can talk about, uh, I know this is a print as well, but it's very different than Simka's print. Can you talk about the process and can you also talk about your inspiration for this work? Um, sure. Uh, this is a project um, making an artist book that has gone on over 12 years at this point. And um, the cuts for the project are almost done and then it has to be assembled. Uh, Peter Crudy, who is a letterpress master, is going to put together the book and I expect that to probably be another two years in the making. Wow. Um, I did illustration for years for publications and uh, so much of the time it was left alone and it was my work completely and I was so excited to see that as a finish when it was printed somewhere. Um, and then I started to also need more time rather than the overnight rush that was really an adrenaline, you know, um, a source of adrenaline, but I started to want to work bigger to take several weeks for images and to do series. Um, so this book was started in 2009 and it was started with several images that then started to come together. And uh, I was interested in doing a book about my grandfather who came to America in 1911, uh, partially to escape the Russian army, he was in Poland, and partially to escape the anti-Semitism that 
existed there. Um, he came here and he started to work as a pocket maker in a garment factory in New York and became really incensed at the way workers were treated and decided to work with getting a union together to fight for a living wage. Um, he was really a strong advocate of getting better conditions in the workplace. He was a very difficult patriarch at home. Um, the children were not allowed to play with toys. Uh, they remembered this years later and I wanted to capture that. I think it just happened to be that even though they're children, they're uh, is some kind of, uh, in the image, there's a knowledge of how they grew up and what happened to them so many years later. Uh, so this book now has about 75 images. They're about 24 by 18 for the most part. Uh, and the book tells the story of the union and the family, and it's called Amalgam. Um, I'm most interested in starting with the drawing and capturing whatever needs to feel right in the drawing. And if the drawing doesn't work out, the print will never work out for me. Um, even though I care about the texture and the rest of it that is added, um, and also the accidents that occur, um, most of it has to exist in the drawing first, or I'm really you know, not even wanting to go ahead with this. Uh, as far as the print goes, it's so collaborative. Um, Justin Sands does the printing and it matters a great deal that he gets the sensitivity in there because it could be a perfect print technically and yet not have the feeling it needs. Um, sometimes like this one, we did a test print and there are areas that I was going to carve out and was glad to see it and leave more black and hadn't known that that was going to frame the picture this way. Uh, we try things also. Um, the, the book for the print, because we're additioning in 15 and then additional proofs, um, has the image with a layer of paper called uh, Gompi, which is translucent, and the children are cut out in that. And it's very, very subtle. At the time, it seemed like a major difference to me. And it was a great deal of effort to cut this all out and she could lay it on. Uh, but um, now I can barely tell the difference in looking at it. Um, so um, I think that's about it for what I wanted to say. I can add that as far as the people in this image, my mother is the baby on the left. And this, her sister and her brother all had different grudges against their father, um, who I loved enormously. He, he grew a little milder, not a whole lot milder, but my mother, 85 years later, my mother recalled how he convinced her that she was too old to play with dolls. And she had one doll, it was made of paper from a newspaper supplement. And she let it fly out the trolley car window and she was regretting it 85 years later. And <laughs> her sister and brother had similar things that they held against him. Um, but anyway, he fought for a living wage and uh, that was a great thing that he did. Uh, it's so fascinating and what a wonderful tribute. And um, <laughs> I just wanna say about the um, Sheen Calais technique that you're talking about. I, um, I, I want to get back to the gallery now and, and look more closely to see if I can notice it, but I wonder if this is why the image is so arresting. It calls you from across the room. It, and Actually, oh, sorry to interrupt, but I okay. don't think this particular print had it because I had to uh, have those for the the addition. So I oh, think okay. this one, I'm not positive, but I don't know that it has it. <laughs> and okay. I also don't know how much difference it makes anymore. <laughs> anyway. Well, then it's interesting because, yeah, whatever um, is going into this technique, the, um, you know, you're 
your particular way of creating the print. Um, it's very luminous and very, um, it, it, it calls to you, it pulls you across the room. It's really, really quite arresting. And um, to then hear the, the background of the image and to imagine that there's uh, how many more like this, I, I really would love to see them. <laughs> and, um, and I know before you talked about how the book's gonna be assembled and I'd love to hear that again, just cause it's fascinating. Um, the dedication to this and the um, craftsmanship that's going into the whole project is amazing. Oh, thank you. I should also toss in my cousin Glenda is here today and she has heard this story and helped me rewrite little parts of it and uh, corrected some of the mistakes in the wording and I'm sure she's set up at this point after reading it a hundred times and having all these re revisions but you know I wanted to uh, thank her <laughs> publicly. My honor and pleasure really <laughs> will never tire of, of this book I can't wait for it to be <laughs> finished for everyone else to, to enjoy yeah uh, but did you want to talk about how the um uh, book the finished book will be assembled um yes um because with all the pages that will be done in letterpress the book will come to over 120 pages and originally it was supposed to be an accordion fold in one piece and that just, Peter said that was not doable. It was already a crazily big book uh, since it's larger than 18 by 24 on one page. Uh, so he came up with this structure for 10 different sections for the book. And then of course we had to add more pages to have it end in the right place. So I'm never gonna get done. That's how it feels now, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's going to be, 10 different concertinas, and then it will be in a, a box. Um, so, and also the paper is made from recycled rags by a Canadian company called Saint Armand. And it's really a nice paper. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> and I've always thought that my grandfather would be really pleased that it's made from recycled rags since he work in making clothing and he would not like that it was made in Canada and not here. Oh, <laughs> what a wonderful project. Thank you so much for sharing this with us, Francis. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm on. Damali. <laughs> um, Damali Miller, who is someone I've had the pleasure to know, at least casually, uh, over the years, uh, has a beautiful piece here. She was invited by uh, Joanne Acey. And um, Damali, your uh, piece is entitled Meditation Path Marker. And it combines a number of elements and materials. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about your process in making this. And it's part of a series, I believe, uh, also. Uh, and um, just what meditative path marker signifies specifically for you, or maybe if you don't wanna talk about that in a larger way, you know, for the viewer, so. Thank you. Um, my work uh, has been focused in the last several years on these um, abstracted uh, landscapes, maps, um, path markers, and really addressing the abstract nature of our relationship to the earth and how we perceive it as well as our experiences and our experiences of just being, of navigating this existence. Um, this is something that has fascinated me as older cultures, indigenous cultures all over the world have um, addressed this and created and an endeavored to understand how we relate to in our place in this cosmology and creating a cosmology to understand it. Um, 
This piece, Meditative Path Marker, is um, indicative. It's there to remind you that you're entering a time or a space that needs introspection, uh, reflection, and looking inward in order to look outward, in order uh, to facilitate a deeper level of seeing. Um, because I've been fascinated with the perception of place, not so much the literal um, image, but the feeling of it, the perception of it, um, um, which is inherently abstract. And then there's this whole discussion that we have with ourselves about the intellectual and the experiential and that the two together um, inform our perceptions, how we see things, how we experience them, how we feel about them. Um, so that this piece, particularly this piece um, is talking about that, as I said, a meditative, taking a moment to pause, uh, to go into a more nuanced and subtler um, looking and experiencing and understanding of our experience. Um, the screws that are in it are purposeful. They're talking about the fact that we may feel there's symmetry to our experiences, but not necessarily the case. Um, they're concrete. So our experiences are um, concrete, um, very real. Um, they are life lessons, hard fought and hard won. Um, for example, the screws on the bottom on the one side are sort of pointing down. They're not all evenly actually the same because our experiences may appear to be the same, but they have different nuances to them. And the rocks and the, stone, the stones are um, indicative of the importance and the substantial um, consistency of nature. Um, that it's there, um, ethereal and very substantial and concrete uh, and spiritual. Um, so uh, there are other components to this, but essentially when I was beginning to think of these, these maps in these um, landscapes, I really began to think about, well, just as, you know, we're often, uh, with a map or if you're on a path, there'll be path markers to indicate the land or the territory or the space ahead or to identify this space. And um, for example, uh, a lot of the um, Aboriginal paintings are maps, which I was very surprised to find. I, I didn't realize mm -hmm. that at first years ago, uh, but every culture has developed objects that address this experience that is um, so subtle, so molecular, so um, intrinsic to our, um, our, our personal experience of life. So our memories and all of those things inform how we see. So um, I think that that's, that's pretty much um, what has occupied, in fact, that is what has occupied my interest in these last uh, few years working on um, these landscapes, which are much, which may have, they're abstract, they may have uh, um, identifiable objects in them, but it's that and the feeling of space, the feeling of that place. I was going to ask you about um, some of the, I'll call them panels. I mean, just to identify them. I mean, we can see the wood, we can see the screws, we can see the, um, the, the stones, uh, but then there are these panels. And can you tell us a little bit about th those, you know, what are they made of? How did, were they made specifically for this piece? Or were they things that you made and that you, that then you incorporated into this piece? Okay, uh, those panels are actually small canvases 
with uh, painted papers uh, attached um, on top uh, with um, inks and acrylic paper, acrylic paints. Um, they were, I, I've done a series of them that were um, addressing seeing abstraction and what the things that I was just describing. Um, this piece, some of this was intentional for this, but a lot of my work, and I'd say the majority of it is intuitive, so that I may start out with a feeling for what I'm wanting to do, but the, uh, as it progresses, it is a conversation. I always feel like artists have a conversation with their work as they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, is that there's a reciprocity and the work informs and dis you discuss with it, you commune with it. You know, and so I can't necessarily see, I know where I think that I want to go with this, but exactly how it's going to come together, maybe a little of this and no, I'm going to change it to this piece. So I have um, a lot of, I may spend a lot of time just exploring painted papers, right? a lot That's of painful. experimental. Yeah, because um, I mean, can you just go to the details? I'm sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Do we have details? Ah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. how boring it would be if we knew exactly what the piece was going to be before we started it. I mean, <laughs> that, <laughs> it's uh, what Francis was talking about too, in terms of just the way, the way the printing can make the difference in how the piece feels. And so all of these little nuances, the things that happen along the way and the decisions that are made, but yeah. Yeah. Great. So that's what I have and I tend to, then I work with that, you know, in composing the piece. Um, right. And I think that well, part of my um, um, inspiration has always been um, music, but specifically when I um, really began to hear um, classic straight ahead jazz, and I discovered Miles and Monk and Dolphy and all of these people. But what it, I was fascinated with was the idea of taking a theme, exploring, um, experimenting with it, and composing in the air with sound. You know, yeah. it was just there's something extremely freeing about experimentation, as well as um, it, it 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 brings you in, it takes you out, but it opens up so much. You know, so, so I think as artists, you know, we have so many different influences. Well, it's a beautiful piece. And again, I encourage people to come to the gallery and see it um, in person. And thank you so much. Thank you. So now let's take a look at Terry Gandy Richardson piece, Stir. Um, I want to Thank Terry for participating. I was the one who invited her because I saw this piece um, online and uh, I, I think about a year ago and it stuck in my mind. And um, then once I learned the uh, history behind it and the inspiration, um, it's, it's fascinating. So I'm just going to ask you, Terry, to talk about the inspiration and talk about the process of creating it, which is also fascinating. Um, sure. Um, you know, I've had this love affair like many have with material of denim, but as an abstract painter, a colorist really, and um, took a break from that and started playing around with this denim that I couldn't throw out, but I couldn't actually wear these jeans anymore. Like literally they were just ripped all over and couldn't wear them and started playing around with this material and started painting on it at first. And um, as I started doing that, I really looked at the material as like human pelt, right? Like the, um, the skin, the second layer of people. And in doing that, as I was choosing which pieces that I was going to paint on, I started really noticing the details in the wear of the material. And, you know, denim is a really sturdy material, but over time it also wears and it gets really comfortable and we all 
love how comfortable um, our deans get. And so just that connection and that love for the material and, and um, it really compelled me to work with it, but also compelled me to not paint on it anymore. And in um, noticing the details in the subtle changes of, of the color, um, where people would wear things like you, I would notice that, you know, there'd be fadings around the pocket and you could see where somebody would carry their wallet or certain people put their keys in their front pocket. So there's always that, that wear of holes near the front pocket. And some people notoriously their knees rip out or it's like right underneath the back pocket. And, um, so then I really felt like I was learning about the people that were wearing these jeans that I was acquiring. Um, and I only use Levi's jeans and that's for, um, for historic purposes, um, you know, Levi's really started um, in the market in, the 18, in 1865, which is around the time that slavery was ending. So as an American fabric and just in American history, that's a very significant time. So I wanted, so in my work, I honor that. And, um, you know, my inspiration for all of my work has always been inspired by the human effort and resilience that's there. And this garment denim really speaks to that, right? That it shows um, in its history, the, the fact that it's a work garment has always been a work garment and just in the way that it wears. And even from a cultural standpoint, um, you know, the industrial revolution, cotton industry, um, all of these, uh, the sexual revolution, like all of these times that denim is really marked um, as a garment that speaks to liberation and work. And it's just interesting hearing Frances talk about her grandfather and just the labor um, concerns and, you know, looking back. So as I was working with this material and just looking into the history of it, also, um, and really looking at this material as a marker, right, for various different um, points in history. So that really is my inspiration for working with um, this material. But this piece um, specifically, um, you know, as an abstract um, artist, you know, I never really know what pieces are going to look like in the end. And this one, more than any other, I knew that I wanted to do these seven pair of arms because I learned that um, part of the process of um, indigo in this country during the time of slavery was a very toxic um, process. And slaves that had run away would be sentenced to the indigo plantations. And because that process was so toxic, it was expected that um, you know, these people would not live out past seven years. So that was their punishment for having run away. And what would happen in this process, they did have paddles, but very often they just really used their arms. So their arms were dyed blue by this, um, this um, concoction. And often the um, irises of their eyes were also um, blue as well. So when I first um, planned to do this piece, I knew I wanted to do this one. I looked at it as a bouquet of these arms and initially I, had, I envisioned doing seven of these bouquets and I was working on a show at the time and just stopped at this one. But then um, last year I was asked to be in a show in Switzerland and I, um, I knew I wouldn't have any real say as to where they would hang this piece. And I wanted to frame it in um, some context. And that's where I, when I added the mat at the bottom that's made out of um, hem to sort of simulate the concoction. Um, and then when I work with um, denim and jeans, I, I, I dissect them. I take the waistbands off first, and then I take off the um, inseams and the back pockets, the front pocket. So I end up with these piles of different pieces and kind of use that as my paint um, or my sculptural pieces to then create um, works from. So amazing. Um, and it was, uh, you know, this was the piece that I was attracted to, but then Terry, of course, gave um, several pieces to choose from, and it was really hard to choose because your work is so amazing. Um, Thank you. And uh, I'm drawn to the denim 
for some of the reasons that you said that, uh, you know, we're all really attached to our genes and, um, you know, the, as a child in the 60s and 70s, jeans were, you know, to be worn forever. Um, and so I have this sort of visceral response to the genes uh, uh, as a material. And then um, to have the layer of uh, what people went through to produce this product is um, just astounding. And I know that you said um, just today that you came across the PBS uh, special about this very process. And I wondered if you could put it in the chat for us to be able to. Sure. Um, so PBS is doing this American experience. Um, it's with the series and they're doing a portion called Riveted and it's the history of denim um, in America. And uh, I will put this link so this link is basically, it's a 10 minute clip. Um, I guess it's kind of, I don't know, just like a promotion or just they're highlighting different sections of what they're, what they're gonna be covering in the full um, show. Um, but it airs tomorrow night at nine o'clock. And I think it airs a couple more times during the month. And it was really funny for me because, you know, this piece, I mean, quite a while ago. And, um, you know, it's just, my heart and really um, so connected to the work that I do. And again, like having a connection to denim, mm -hmm. assuming, right, the connection to cotton and cotton industry, but not really knowing um, a whole lot of detail. So as I started doing more and more research to find that, and then years later, now, you know, doing this artist talk and then knowing that this um, PBS um, show was going to air, to see this particular 10 minute section where it talks about the indigo process, um, the slave um, contribution to the history of this garment. Um, pretty amazing because there's an illustration in there and it does show these hands that are dyed blue. So it was quite kind of a full circle moment. Wow, that's that's astonishing synchronicity, really. You know, like it's too simple. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Terry. Um, Karen, um, thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, I'm so happy you, you accepted. Um, so now we can open it up to some questions. And I see there's already some questions in the chat. Um, and so I'll read the questions in the chat and then we can um, ask each other questions, however it works. Uh, if you want to bring the image back, Susan can always do that. I just wanted to mention that. Um, so, uh, Hazel Hankin said, I love everything about this piece. And I believe that was when Damali's piece was up. I was actually responding um, to Francis's piece a while ago, oh. but I love Damali's <laughs> piece as well. Amazing. All of them, really. Um, and that, and that, I should have put her name in. I'm, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Did you want to ask anything about it particularly? I just wanted to add that um, it's so beautiful and, you know, technically amazing and everything else. But what really strikes me is the emotion in those faces. I'm just completely stunned by it. It's like, it, it's just um, incredible, you know, it, it's so moving. And she she captured that in those in those faces. It's that, that just blew me away. That that part of it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Francis. Bravo. Um, I I had a question, Francis. Um, I I've had the um, the wonderful opportunity of seeing um, a number of the pages from this book, and they just blow me away. Um, but I haven't seen all of it yet, and I'm very excited to see all of it. But Francis, I was wondering, I don't think I ever asked you this, um, when you started this project, did you envision that it was going to be this monumental project, that it was going to grow this, this far um, when you first started? Not at all, no. Um, I had no idea. And then just one thing led to another. And then I got involved in writing more. And then... Um, I had this fellowship at the library, as, as you know. Um, and 
I passed this area in the library at, you know, the Coleman Center right outside the office. And it had something about Carnegie giving all this money for libraries. So he did a lot of great things, but I also knew that he had a connection with doing something really terrible in labor history. So, um, and it was a feud between Carnegie and Frick. Um, and it was a disaster where they called in Pinkertons and a lot of people died. So, um, and, and it was a story at the end of that where Carnegie just wanted to let bygones be bygones and said, let's meet. And Frick said, I'll meet you in hell where we'll both be going. So then that set off a whole bunch of images, hell images about other labor disasters. And then let, that led to other stuff and more discoveries led to things about, you know, in, in history in general and uh, especially around the labor movement. So it just kept expanding and expanding. And now I think it's it's almost done. And uh, yeah, so I'd love to show you the rest of them. And thank you so much for inviting me to this Thanks lovely show. Thank you so much for participating. It really, mm -hmm. um, it's great having your work in the gallery. Thank you. Uh, so there's another question in the chat from Fred Benheim for Terry. And he says, uh, Terry, I love this work. Why did you put sand in the hands instead of something lighter? I hung it. <laughs> <In parentheses. laughs> also, I heard on the radio today that denim was associated with black culture. So I wonder if uh, Fred, if you wanna comment, did you hear about this PBS thing that um, Terry shared? Yeah, I, it must've been the same uh, segment I, I heard. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was on NPR, yeah. It's funny, Fred, thank you for hanging the piece. I thought you did a really great job, but um, it's not yeah. sand. It's not sand inside, it's denim. It's fully oh, it's denim. So, it's, it's so heavy. Oh my gosh, it's solid yeah, denim? It's, it's hand sewn. Um, the, so my three dimensional pieces are all hand sewn. The two dimensional pieces are like glued, glued and sometimes tacked, but um, yep, uh, hand sewn and stuffed with denim. So denim has weight. Ooh. Interesting. Um, and I was helping Fred hang it. And um, it, it's interesting the weight because, you know, no one else is going to have this experience, but we can share that it, it is, it's very physical. It's, it's like body parts that in yeah. weight, you know, it has that heft to it. And it has and I it to the gallery. I knew the box um, would be too, like, kind of big for you to store. So I took it out of the box and wrapped it. And it's kind of like a body. Yes, yeah. yes. I had to move it. And I kept saying to people, don't worry, it's not a body. We're just starting <laughs> it over. But I mean, the weight of history too, it feels like that those arms should have weight to them, that they, they should have physical weight. And that weight comes through as you see it. The, and like the every aspect of that material is really special in that way, like that human connection and yeah. touch and feel, like everything about it from being made, being worn, and just even just like everybody has a connection to it. Yeah, that's, and I, I wanted to just comment, uh, Francis, I mean, you're, that, that it is such a haunting image. And um, your grandfather came to this country at the same time that my grandfather came also. And, the, and I think, you know, the, the, the way in which the first generation that's here, is that the, the trauma that the, that the refugees, the immigrants experience, and this goes through all cultures, and I'm sure that it is just as true today, is that there's so much trauma for the people who come that the next generation is the recipient of that trauma in a different way. I mean, the, 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 these children, I don't know that I could live with these children on my wall, honestly. They're so <laughs> powerful. They are so powerful. Um, and I wanted something you didn't talk about. I mean, this is, a, this is a, a, a lino print, you know, so that this is just, are they all, did you do them all in the same uh, um, linoleum, basically, um, for the book? 
Are they all, all the prints? What am I trying to ask? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yes. Are they yes. All the <laughs> They're all, uh, most, all of them are linoleum cuts and they're 24 inches high by 18 inches. Uh, a lot of them have Chine Collet editions, so they're in color. And some are printed on some marbled papers and other things that, you know, like there's a paper that looks like fire. And then some even have some digital prints mixed in with the linoleum. So there's some variety in there. Um, I've gotten very used to linoleum after starting to carve it so many years ago. And I get bored, get away from it and learn something else with another material and then come back to it and it makes it fresher in a way for me. Um, and um, I don't know, the, some of the, the images that we've done lately are lithographs. Um, so that's, you know, a, a matter of trying to get them to mesh with the with the images that are linoleum. But I don't know, since it's made by the same person, I think that it more or less will blend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just curious, it's just an extraordinary project. Oh, thank you. Are there any other questions on the, on the chat or comments? Uh, go ahead, Joanne, you could unmute. First of all, I just want to say um, congratulations to all the artists that were invited and for the great insight for the people who invited them, including me. But um, I just, um, the, the show is, is really beautiful, but to hear um, the stories um, have really, really, it, it's just so much to absorb and such beautiful and in some ways sad stories that really um, show themselves in a whole new light. Um, so I'm really, really grateful that I was able to join the, the, the group today. And I just wanna say thank you. And also for all of the artists in this show, I think you brought a whole new um, light to our gallery. So I'm really happy about that too. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. Other questions, comments? I just wanted to add that it is a really stunning show. And I know that Ellen has said it many times now, but um, I really urge everybody, um, if you get a chance to come and see it, it's, it is really stunning. I know, and I wish that we could have had all the artists here to talk. Um, but we would have really had some Zoom fatigue if we did that. <laughs> um, so if there are no more questions, um, I wanna make sure that you all know about our next show coming up. It is Richard Barnett, the, um, uh, I thought I wrote down the title. It's the title? The Ghosts of War. The Ghosts of War. Yeah. Is that it? I know it has ghosts. Yeah, anyway, so. his, show, his show opens on um, the 16th and it goes through March 20th. And the reception is on February 19th. That's Saturday from two to four. Uh, so I hope you all will join us for that as well. But um, I'll remind you again about our closing party for this show that uh, is going to be, um, Ellen has already researched the weather and it's definitely going to be a warmer <laughs> day than the last time we tried it's to do better that. better than January 15th. That's yeah. the only thing I can guarantee you now. Um, it itself pokes a tiny fill apparently, but anyway, what are these groundhogs now? Yeah. <laughs> it will still so, be winter, but it won't be 12 degrees. I don't know. Uh, because of COVID, we're not packing the gallery with people as we've done in the past. So the gathering is outside and people go in in small groups to look at the work, and which is also nice because you can really see the work better. And, um, and there'll be wine and snacks. So I hope you'll join us on the 13th from two to four. Um, does anyone else have a show uh, that's 
upcoming. Actually, Kay has a show that, when does your show close? Kay, do you want to mention it? Um, it's in New Haven and it comes down February 20th. It's uh, at the UI Center of Contemporary Art in New Haven, if anyone's there. And uh, Kay just did a talk and I can tell you that it's worth traveling if you're anywhere near New Haven to make a point of seeing it. Thank you. Um, so I think that wraps up our talk for today. Thank you all for coming. Thank you artists for participating and for sharing your stories. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Susan, enjoy Thank the rest you. of Thank you so much. Happy birthday, Susan. Yes. And oh, see you yes. Happy oh. birthday. <laughs> see you all at the gallery next Sunday. Yeah. Thank you so Bye much. Now. Thank Great. you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Oops.